was that best kind of teacher. The sort of teacher who doesn't just give you information. The teacher who teaches you how to learn for yourself. Giving you a sense of how to ask questions and how to look at what you've done. And that's where his teachings keep focusing, what you've done, what you're doing, and how to monitor the results. Sometimes you can monitor them while you're doing things. Other times it, you have to look back on them. But the important thing in our lives is to learn to look at, us, at what, we're, what we're doing, not just our ideas of what we're doing or what we would like to have result from what we're doing, but what we're actually doing, what the actual results are. And how to measure those results, how to judge the results in such a way that you can learn and do better next time. This element of feedback is essential in all learning. Someone once conjectured that if people didn't act, if they were just totally passive observers of the universe, they wouldn't learn anything at all, wouldn't know anything at all. They'd have no idea of how cause and effect acts. They'd simply be watching a passing show. But it's because we're participants, because we shape things. That we begin to get a sense of cause and effect. You do this and that results. You stick your finger in a flame and you burn it. Those things are easy to notice. Other things require more attention. Because sometimes we may get results we think that we like, but over time they begin to show that they're not such good things after all. And so the Buddha teaches us the attitude we should have. One is he cautions that when you make a mistake, don't get yourself get tied up in feelings of remorse or guilt. There's one sutra where he talks about people who've heard the teaching that you know, when you do something, when you kill or when you steal, do anything else unskillful like that, there's going to be bad consequences. Don't get all bound up with, with remorse. The consequences of our actions oftentimes depend not only on what we do, but also the state of mind that follows on what we've done. Remorse is not a good state of mind. Compassion is the resolve not to make that mistake again, which is a compassionate intention, both for yourself and for the people around you. That works to mitigate the results of your past mistakes, if it's genuine. So that's the first line of instruction, is not to feel remorse, but simply to notice your mistakes and have the goodwill and have the compassion not to want to do them again. And then learn to follow through. As the Buddha pointed out, simply good intentions are not, not enough. You have to learn how to make them skillful in how you implement them. And then watch the actual results. This requires honesty learning how to notice your mistakes, admit your mistakes, and then try to figure out how to do, do things different the next time. There's a story they tell of a school of medicine, very highly regarded. People were coming to study brain surgery, and you could assume that everybody who applied was smart. And the question was, would they make good brain surgeons? Just because you're smart doesn't mean you're necessarily a good brain surgeon. And they cast around and tried various ways of finding the questions to ask in interviews that would ferret out the people who would not make good surgeons. And one of the most effective ones they found was the question, do you ever make mistakes? And the candidates who would say, well, no, not really. Those are the ones who were struck out. The ones who would say, yes, make mistakes all the time. Then they'd ask, well, can you tell us about a mistake you made recently? What you did to correct it, or what you would do to correct the next time around? And the candidates were sure that they had thought about their mistakes and 
and made plans for the next time around. Those are the ones who were admitted to the school. The same principle applies to your meditation. Noticing when you make a mistake, what works and what doesn't. And then if it doesn't work, having the ingenuity to figure out something, another approach, another way of doing things the next time around. This is where real insight develops, because what is insight but insight into cause and effect? We often hear that the three characteristics, you know, in impermanence or inconstancy, stress and suffering, not self, that's the substance of Buddhist insight. But if you look a little bit deeper, when the Buddha talks about discernment, talks about insight, it's always a question of cause and effect. The very first question he says that leads to insight is the question, what if I do it will lead to long-term happiness? What if I do it will lead to my long-term suffering? And within that question, all the seeds for insight are already there. One is the notion that what you do is important for happiness and suffering. And two of those last three words, my long-term happiness, my long-term suffering. If you look at them, they correspond to the three characteristics. The my, of course, corresponds to questions of self, not self. Long-term refers to questions of permanence and impermanence, constancy and inconstancy. And happiness and suffering, that's the issue of stress. These are the things by which we judge successful actions. In other words, if a happiness is not long-term, if it's going to turn you on, it's nothing that you would want to claim as your own. And if something's suffering, obviously suffering, that immediately alerts you that it's not something you'd want to claim as your own. Unless it's something that you do, we don't like doing it, but when you get the results, they lead, do lead to long-term happiness. So that's when you have to develop wisdom, have to develop patience. But you use these criteria as ways of judging your actions. When you do this, does it lead to happiness? Yes, no. Is the happiness lasting? Yes, no. And to begin with, you'll find that the question of lasting is relative. Sometimes there's a happiness that's short-lived. Other times there's a happiness that lasts for a while, but eventually it runs out as well. But at least it's heading in the right direction. Ultimately, of course, the whole purpose of the practice is to get a happiness that is so unaffected by space and time that the word long-lasting doesn't even apply. And questions of my don't even apply anymore. But it is a happiness. That's where we're aiming. But we leave, use these criteria as ways of judging our actions. And so this is where the three characteristics come in, in judging this process of cause and effect in terms of what we do and the results we get. And if things don't measure up to what we'd like, well, you, there, are two re, there are two resources for you. One is the experience of other people, and two, there's your own ingenuity, your ability to imagine alternative ways of doing things. Asking the right questions. How, what would happen if I did it this way? What would happen if I did it that way? And sometimes in your imagination you can figure out the results, because we've had enough experience with life. We're not totally green. And other times you have to put things to the test. But either way, it's that ability to ask that question, what if I did it some other way? How, what would that be? What would that result in? So it's a combination of many faculties in the mind. One is your honesty. The second one is your ability to admit mistakes without getting tied up in remorse or regret. And the third is your ingenuity. Fourth is your willingness to listen to the advice of other people who've practiced. 
there's that famous passage in the Galama Sutta where the Buddha says, don't go by texts, don't go by traditions. And everybody thinks it stops right there, but it doesn't. He says also, don't go by your own opinions, don't go by reasoning things out through logic. In other words, you can't give final authority to any of these things. He says, when you know for yourself that something is skillful, praised by the wise, then go ahead and do it. Notice that you know for yourself, but you also take into consideration the advice of other people, people who are experienced. You have to learn to balance those things in as well. Ordinarily, we think it's a question of either listening to other people or just listening to ourselves. And the Buddha is basically saying, well, you can't trust either, totally. You have to check things out in the laboratory of your actions. When you do something, what happens as a result? You can't simply fall back and say, well, that's the way I always do things. That's the kind of person I am. Well, that's the kind of person who doesn't learn anything. It's the person who's willing to change when necessary in order to do things more skillfully. That's the kind of person you can turn yourself into. That's the kind of person you can make yourself be. If it weren't for that ability, there'd be no point in the Buddha's having taught us anything anyhow. We'd all be set in our ways, and it would just be a an idle exercise to teach people. But everyone's capable of changing. And it's best if you not look at it in the, in the, through that framework of, well, this is the way I am, because that tends to tie you down. Look at things simply in terms of action and result, or the question of who you are put aside for the time being. And if you don't get tied up in the idea, well, this is my action, my way of doing things, which is a form of clinging, you find that you're freer to learn, freer to change, freer to become more and more skillful. This is how we learn. The ability to admit our mistakes, learn from them, and just put them aside. and having the right cr criteria for judging what is a mistake. If it's harmful to ourselves and harmful to others, it's obviously a mistake. If it's harmful to either one, it's also a mistake. And learning how to check for what exactly is harmful, what is helpful, that requires that you be observant. So it's a combination both of doing and watching. That allows us to learn, and having the in ingenuity to do things in new ways, and the sensitivity to watch for the important signs of having done things right, having done things skillfully, and having done things unskillfully. This is what learning means. And as we apply it more and more to our meditation, more and more to our lives as a whole, We find that it brings real, real results in changing our lives. All for the better. <laughs>